God's hand in the Old Testament. This shows God's hand from Old and New Testament. It has nine lessons to it, so we're not going to be able to finish it this year. Uh, it'll go into January, but that's okay. Uh, and I think you'll find it interesting. The lessons are a little shorter, which works well for us in a 45-minute time frame. Uh, so let's begin. Read responsibly Psalm 19. <coughs> the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we, your children, come humbly before you. We stand in awe of your almighty power and rejoice in your wonderful promises. As we learn more of your faithfulness, by your spirit increase our faith and confidence. For your love in Christ, we give you thanks and praise. We ask this in his name. Amen. So you each have a lesson there. Grab it. Uh, faithfulness. Make sure. Faithfulness is described as being consistently trustworthy in keeping one's promises, contracts, or treaties. A faithful person can be trusted and relied on. God laid the foundation of his faithfulness in the creation of the world. In it, we see his love on display. We see our Lord wanting nothing more than to create a world where he could live in joy with people who shared his image. And as we shall see, nothing would keep God from realizing this gracious goal. Studying God's word. So we're going to spend some time, as I mentioned, in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 this morning. First of all, Genesis chapter 1, the love of God was at work in creation. Follow along. Maybe it's been a while since you read this account of creation, the six days of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, and it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the, the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kind. And every winged bird, according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas. And let the birds increase on the earth, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kind, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. That's as far as we were supposed to go. 
Any quick questions on that section? It's always good to read that, even though we've heard it a hundred times. It's always good to read that. By the way, uh, I was doing some reading this week in our theological quarterly magazine, Wisconsin Lutheran Quarterly. It's, it's written especially for pastors. But the lead article in this edition of the quarterly is called Genesis 1 in Science. It was written by a, a, a fellow Wells member named Dr. Arthur Eggert. He's Professor Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin. And he has his doctorate in chemistry and informatics. And he has teamed up with his son-in-law, Pastor Jeff Kieda of Westland, Michigan. And they have written a book on apologetics, especially regarding creation. I have this here. I, I scanned it. If you would like a copy of it, I'd be happy to email it to you. If you'd like a hard copy, I'd be happy to give you a hard copy too. Uh, Dr. Eggert uh, learned Hebrew just so that he could be able to check out the original uh, chapters one, two, and three. And what he does is goes, goes through each day of creation and says, this is what we can say on the basis of God's word. And this is what we can say on the basis of science. And he, he does a very careful job of saying, and we can't say more than that. And then at the end of his article, he says, okay, here's how you can use this in your apologetics. In other words, defending the Bible's truth. Uh, I'll admit it, some of this was way over my head. Not theologically, but the science, way over my head. But a lot of it was really good. So uh, I'm happy to make that available to you if you want this. It's, you know, it's getting to be winter. What else you got to do at night but read something like this? It's about 20 pages long or so. So maybe 10 or 12 if this were a, a, a one, you know, all written in one page. Very interesting. Again, your brother in the faith. Uh, he's made it now in, in his in retirement. This is his thing, and he's, he's very good at it, using science and the, and the word of God to help people say, you know, faith in God is not that unreasonable. In fact, it's rational. And what God has done for us, uh, tremendous man. So I'll maybe take some, post a sign-up sheet or something like that later on. Back to the text. What was present before the event of verse 1? God was. God was there and nothing else. Can you can you think of that? Can you can you possibly imagine that? Nothing. Just God. That blows the mind. If you can't go there. Because everything we think of starts with something. Even time. There was no time before Genesis 1-1. No time. See, eternity is not forever time. Eternity is living in no time. And I can't imagine that either because everything I think of, every part of my being is limited by time. Number two, what, uh, what three words are repeated in verses 3, 6, 9, 14, 20, and 24? And God said. And God said. Go ahead. I actually have a question about Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, it does talk about like the water okay. and stuff. So when did, I don't know, when did that come into that, 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 there that, 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 that first creative act, there was earth and water and it was all together. Uh -huh. And we're, it, we did not, there was no definition to that. And so things needed to be separated. Dr. Edgar talks about that, you know, creating these atoms that created, you know, H2O, creating water. Um, from a chemist, he knows what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, so all together, and then God just, well, just this murky mess that we have a hard time even imagining. Good question. And there seems to be water. He talks about waters above the earth. Dr. Eggers does a good job of talking about that, too. Again, we're not absolutely sure that we can't say more than the Bible says, and we can't say less than the Bible says on that. Good question. Number uh, so he, he, God says his his word. This morning, as we celebrate the Reformation of the Church, it's all about the Word of God. And in our world, our world wants nothing to do with the Word of God. Even Christians belittle and don't cherish the Word of God. But we have this tremendous gift of God's Word, which is all powerful, and it's the means through which He saves us. A tremendous thing. Number three, as you view a breathtaking sunset or sunrise with all its blazing colors, what comes to your mind? It almost altered it, huh? All right, it, it reminds you of the power of God. What else? That it looks similar, comparing to 
Okay, what that must have looked like for Adam and Eve <clears throat> as they looked out that first night. And not only his power, but but his love and his care. For, he wanted you to enjoy this earth. That was the in the in the introduction. God simply created this earth so that he could have a place where he could enjoy life with his creatures in this holy environment. And he didn't make it black and white. He could have. Instead, he made this beautiful earth for them to enjoy. Number four, as you behold, as you hold a newborn child, what do you learn about the love of God? Pardon me? The depth of oh, his love and right. the enormity of his right. everlasting. Just, just so amazing that God would create this life and use two humans to do that. And the blessings that he gives. How he loves us. We, we, have, we have something else now in our lives to love. Uh, that's what God is. He is love. The blessings that you are there if you're the parent now you are going to be the one to bless that child materially but especially uh, earthly uh, i'm sorry especially spiritually you have this bless you're going to impart god's blessings to that child and in return all the blessings that child brings to you and i understand because of sin there are heartaches that's not the way god intended it but that's what you know our god is all about he's faithful his promises uh, number five, reflect on other aspects of God's creation that impress on you the love of God. The fact that it just doesn't All right. Order. You know exactly when the sun is going to set today and when it's going to rise tomorrow. We know where the stars are going to be tonight. We know where they're going to be 100 years from now. We know where they were 100 years ago. Tremendous order. The seasons, they come about. We don't have to worry about that. Yeah, sure, we're, we might be concerned about climate change or what's happening in our world, but tremendous order. Think what chaos there would be if you, you didn't know what tomorrow, technically speaking, was going to bring. I mean, obviously, you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, but you can count on certain things happening. Because God wants you to live in that security, <clears throat> the laws of nature. Well, how much did God need to know to begin with? Yeah, it's hard. You know, as they discovered his creation for them with all and all they had was their eyes and their hands i think that really that's what i thought of when i when i uh read this question think about uh what i, I read an article the other day uh, we only have five percent of the ocean depths mapped out and, and that and, that, and then we start talking about space and just the limitlessness of that it's just incredible what god did the immensity, it's so beyond us. And, and, you know, God has so many things he could be thinking about, but he thought about you. Scripture says that before he created the world, he knew you by name. That, that's enormous. And he did all this for you. Anything else? All right, let's move into chapter 2. Refer to Genesis. I'll read these passages. Genesis 2. Seven, turn the page here. Verse seven says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. And now to verse 24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And then it says, read Genesis 3, 1 to 15. So keep those verses in mind, God's perfect creation, and then the ruin of it. Here we go. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. I once asked my Hebrew professor at the seminary, what does that verse mean, more crafty? And the example he gave me was, well, we usually think, you know, smart as a, as a fox, right? And dumb as a lamb. He said, there, there seems to be in the Hebrew some indication that that's, that's the case with the serpent. We wouldn't think serpent being so wise, so crafty, smart as a fox. But that's behind the Hebrew word here. Obviously, something changed with snakes. 
by the way, Dr. Eggers does a good job of that too. Re recognizing from science, yes, things do change. That doesn't mean there's evolution, but things do change. And we, we gotta be careful about what we say about the changes that occur in species. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I have commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. As far as we are supposed to go. Any quick questions on that? Tough section. You know, we always say, why did God put that tree there if he knew Adam and Eve were going to eat it? Because he did. He knew that. Martin Luther, we, first of all, we can't, you know, we don't know the mind of God. But Martin Luther said, you know, this tree, that door is going to open and close because of the wind. This tree here was where Adam and Eve worshipped God. God said, don't eat from that tree. Eat from this one over here, the tree of life, and any other tree in the garden. Here was their one thing they did to show their love and their devotion to the God who had created everything for them, and they blew it. Any anybody else on this section before you dig into the questions? All right, let's take a look at it. They knew enough not to take accountability for their actions. <laughs> See how immediately sin infects every fiber of their being every way they think about one another now is radically changed they're going to cover themselves literally and figuratively they're going to blame the blame game starts adam blames eve eve blames god for putting the serpent there notice god doesn't answer them he doesn't deal with these silly objections he's got something far more he wants to do. By the way, that verse that says, uh, when, they, when they heard God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the Hebrew, they would give us the impression, this is what God regularly did each day. Oh, in the cool of the day, that's when we meet with God in a special way. Now, they can't see him, obviously, but they know his presence is there. This seemed to be something he regularly did, and on this day, everything was different. Go ahead. Question? I don't think so. So Satan does not have a, he's a spirit, he does not have a body, so he needed something in order for them to see. Obviously, snakes don't talk. Here's another one. People who uh, want to make fun of the Bible, do snakes talk? Well, no. But evil spirits do. Legs yeah, all absolutely. Before, before, before that, snakes had legs. Because later on, God, God, what God said, you will crawl on your belly now as a big reptile. Go ahead. So, in the beginning, with mm -hmm. all this creating taking part, mm -hmm. there's no mention of Satan. No. How do we know that it's Satan that's in the serpent? Just from what is else is written in the Bible and what he does here, he's the father of lies. He's a liar and the father of lies. That's a good question. It does not say, oh, and the devil, it doesn't say that. I'll admit that. Uh, it would come from what else God says both to him and uh, later on in scripture. Uh, and then the question is, well, where did Satan come from? Well, he was a, he was a, he and his 
evil spirits were created, good angels, someday during the six days of creation, possibly day three or four would make a good guess. There's a verse in the Psalms that talks about something like that, but we're not going to peg it down. We know that they were all created good up until they were that way up until day seven, because God looked at everything and was good. So then sometime between day seven and the day that's mentioned here in chapter three, Satan led a rebellion against God and God cast them out of heaven. Uh, Jude and Peter talk about that. We just don't know how long that is. Go ahead, Lou. I've got a question, but this, is this why we pray three different bodies temptation? It's one of the, uh, that along with others, yes. Uh, God doesn't tempt anybody, but we're praying that he would guard and keep us from such temptation, and when temptation comes, that he will help us overcome and win the victory. Good question. But was there a heaven at that time? Yes. But again, when was that? Yeah. God threw the angels out of heaven, it says. We have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help that it's not chronological. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Number six. What was God's command to his newly created human beings? Don't eat from that tree. Don't eat from that tree. Here's the one command. This was their way to show their love and their devotion to their God and their thankfulness to him. Okay, number seven. How did they respond? They didn't listen. Okay, now, and, and it's very important that you recognize that uh, it says, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Adam was not on the other side of the Garden of Eden when this occurred. He was right there with him. To whom had God given the command, don't eat from this tree? Look yeah. at Adam. And he, now, God could have given him to Eve later on, but we assume that Adam shared this command with his wife. <laughs> Good one. Uh, oh, shoot, I should have told you. Oh, I thought I did. Now, he was there. Adam's responsibility there was let's get out of here. Let's leave. But he did not do that. And that was his responsibility. Maybe he had a secret desire to be, have knowledge like God. Well, I mean, that's what he, he said. Look, God's not so good. He's keeping something from you. You'll know evil as well as good. Like, that's really? They doubted God's perfect love for them. He, he sowed the seeds of doubt in their hearts. It wasn't because they were hungry. No. Because they had everything they needed. They, knew, they never knew hunger so up until then. The testing part was yeah. you'll gain wisdom you'll, and be like You'll God. be like God. Which, think about it, human beings have always wanted to be God. We want to call the shots. We want to make the decision. We want to say what's right and wrong. We want to say what's best for us. That has always been the problem. I think there's a little bit of um, confusion there because we were created in his Okay, let's talk about that. Good point. There, there are a lot of false ideas about what the image of God means. First of all, it doesn't mean that we look, that Adam and Eve look like God because God doesn't have a body. When we think of image, uh, we, uh, we're not just talking about their intellect, we're mainly talking about their will and the holiness. The holy, I always draw, when I'm teaching this to catechism kids, I always draw two straight lines on the, on the whiteboard. Here was the way God thought about things, felt about things, talked about things. Here's the way he acted. Here's the way Adam and Eve thought, felt, talked, and acted. They were directly parallel to one another. The Bible talks about us having that image recreated in us by faith in Jesus, not perfectly, because you and I still have a sinful nature. Think about that. Adam and Eve did not have a sinful nature. They did not contend with a sinful nature when they stood at that tree. You and I, if we had our tree today, we would have. We did, we do. Yeah, they were in the image of God. And they had the ability not to sin. That's the way theologians talk about it. They had the ability not to sin. You and I do not have that ability any longer. 
So a lot of people are like, well, God didn't put the tree there. Well, they had, they could have said no. They absolutely. Show me your love. I made you perfect. You have the ability to perfectly carry this out. Yeah, and we, you know, there are a lot of questions here about why God did what he did. And we will always wonder. And we won't have the answers. I know I would recently had a conversation with someone. This is similar to this. And, but why? Why, mm -hmm. why? why did God do the things that he did? I'm like, well, why does anybody do what they do? Yep. You don't know yep. because you're not in that person's mind. You yep. can only speculate. You only know what they tell you. And this is all God tells us. You know, you read through the book of Job. It's not easy, but it's very beneficial. Job wanted to know too. Why, God? Why? And God said, where were you when I set the limits of the ocean? You think you're so smart that you can understand it all? You're not so smart. You wouldn't understand it if I told you. Good, good. We, we want answers. He, he gives us what, he, what we need to know. Uh, they, they disobeyed, number seven, number eight, they were unfaithful, but God does not respond in kind. What did he do, verse nine? He comes to them because I'm going to give you a promise. He's going to seek them out. He wants them to understand what they've done. He, look, he was looking for a confession. He didn't get it right away. And we don't know how this conversation continued after the end of chapter three. I don't think God just walked away from them. I think they probably had a lot of questions for God. Yeah, he comes to them. He confronts them with their sin because he wants to announce to them, I've got a plan. You're not going to be able to take care of this on you. You've done something for which you will never be able to make up. But I can. I will. I promise. Number nine, what was God's promise to Adam and Eve and to a world affected by sin in verse 15? A Savior. A Savior. He will crush your head. Most Bible scholars consider this to be the first promise of a Savior. Adam and Eve were saved the same way you and I are. They believed that God was going to send them a Savior from sin. We believe that God has sent us a Savior from sin. Here was that promise of a Savior. Again, this, I, you know, impressed me. I think this conversation went on afterwards. But Jesus is right there. Ab the Son of God, absolutely right there. You know, later on, Eve gives birth to a son, and she says, I have, uh, verse chapter 4, I have gotten a man, and the Hebrew just says, I've gotten a man, the Lord. Did she think did she think this was her savior from sin? Well, she found out real quickly that her child was sinful and not her savior. But interesting, our translation say I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. But the Hebrew just says, I've gotten a man, the Lord. She trusted. Number 10, what would this make, mean for Adam and Eve's place in the beautiful creation God had made for them? He did not immediately send them to hell. They continued to live. But everything changed. And, and, and they learned what yeah. the good and evil was. Here's the consequences of our sin. You know, God just mentions a few of them. And they hit right at the special purpose that God had both for Adam and then for Eve. You know, for Adam, you're, you're supposed to provide for your family. And I gave you the ability to do that perfectly. And it would have been the absolute joy of your life. But now you're ruined it. And it's going to be by the sweat of your brow. Eve, I... I specially designed you to bear children, to fill this earth. And that's that's going to still be your heart's desire, but it's going to be troublesome. It's going to be hard. So, if, you know, sin affected these 
things for which God specifically created them to do, their purpose, their highest purpose, then certainly would affect everything else, and it did. And they learned that all too quickly. If you read through the first eight, nine chapters of Genesis, it just, it's so heartbreaking how quickly things became so evil, filled with evil. God said, every inclination of their heart is only evil all the time. Nothing's changed in thousands of years. Who didn't even know what evil was? I know it. How that Imagine must, that? It just must have mm -hmm. shaped me. Um, just, I mean, we, we not only see it immediately, but they had no clue yeah. when God said evil. They didn't even know what that yeah. was. Yeah. But Cain knew that he was just wrong. Right. Wrong right. Right. And how that must have shattered. Our son is dead. He was murdered by our other son. Look what evil that done. Um, so they would continue to live there, but with sin's consequences. Even though Adam and Eve were unfaithful and failed to keep God's command, there was one thing they could count on. It was God's faithfulness to save mankind so they could continue to live with them. In the coming weeks, we will see God's promise repeated many times. More and more details are revealed about how God would carry it out. Number 11, God is faithful to us and will fulfill his promises. What difference does this truth make in our daily lives? Oh, for the future. Absolutely. All right. You're talking eternal life. All right. I have God's promise of eternal life, and I'm holding on to that. Daily life. What promises of God do you hang on to each day living in this sinful world? Forgiveness. I have forgiveness. My sins have contributed to the evil condition of this world. But I know that I am forgiven through Christ. I belong to him. I belong to him in a world that seems so uh, clueless. Like, why am I here? What am I doing? You, have the, you are a child of God. He redeemed you with the holy, precious blood of his son so that you could be his forever. You talk about a high purpose in life. Other promises of God. I will never leave you or forsake you. The, the flip side of that is, I am with you always. Even the end of the age. God is always with us. Always. Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Somehow, as bad as it is, God is going to use it for his good purposes. He promises that. Think of the 23rd Psalm. Tremendous promises there. Other ones. God will only Psalm give you a Psalm 46. Let's focus on it today. God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains quake. You've got nothing to be afraid of. move on. Number 12, what are some ways we can respond to God's faithfulness to us? Praise him. Share it with others. Gather together to praise him. This is what our faithful God has done for us. In a world in which we don't know what's going to happen this afternoon, our God sees it all perfectly clearly, and he's got it all planned out, and you're part of the plan, and we go to heaven. He's got it all figured out. And he gives, you, he gives you 24 hours each day to live in that confidence. I'm going to do what my God has called me to do. Whatever that is in your life at that particular moment, I'm going to do this with my confidence in my God. Um, he's given you gifts. Paul talks about those in Romans and 1 Corinthians. Tremendous gifts. I see them in a congregation of believers. And we work together as a congregation. Here, this is the gift I have, and this is what I'm going to use for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Because this will help them in their path with, uh, on their walk with God. That is a very powerful 
very purposeful thing. I'll use my gifts faithfully because my God has been faithful to me in everything. Anybody else on this first section? All right, so we've taken a look at the promise. Now let's take a look at a couple of things uh, here for the future. First Peter chapter 1, page 857. Page 857. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9 and 18 to 21. Page 857. Verses 3 to 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you do greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. That section is so powerful. So powerful. And now verses 18 to 21. For you know that it was not with, with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so that your faith and hope are in God. Peter, this is one of the most hope-filled sections in all of the Bible. And Peter repeatedly says, here is the reason you can live each day, in fact, eternally in hope. What event causes us to live in hope? Resurrection. Jesus resurrected from the dead. How many times does Paul mention it? Three, four, five in, a, in that section. The resurrection of Christ from the dead means everything. That means everything God has planned, everything he ever said is true, and it will happen. He says, he through faith are shielded by God's grace until the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All of history is winding down to that one great moment when the Lord Jesus returns and reverses everything that happened in Genesis chapter 3. Creates a new heavens and a new earth, the home of righteousness. He raises us from the dead. Finally, finally, we'll no longer be plagued by sin or evil or even temptation. Death will be gone. Finally. And it's going to happen. Uh, number 14. What are we told about the inheritance that awaits us in verses 4 and 5? All right. Everything in this life wears out, decays, dies, everything. Everything we touch everything we are. But here is one thing that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you. Your eternal life. What was the price paid to secure that inheritance? Verses 18 and 19. The blood of Jesus Christ. Which does not perish. It was not with gold or silver. Think about it. The only thing that will last after the destruction on the last day is the blood of Jesus. He redeemed you eternally. It's eternal. He will obviously raise you again. But the blood Jesus shed on Calvary's cross is the blood he has now, is the blood that will last forever. Because Jesus wants you to be sure that he has redeemed you forever. There's not going to be a change. You know, we live in that insecurity in this world. Oh, this could change in a moment. The situation is going to be different next week. 
Think of how many people are just wringing their hands or what's going to happen come Wednesday. Just, oh, everything's going to change. Well, there's one thing that will never change. The faithfulness of your God and the eternal life that he has in store for you. We've got one more section to read. 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21. So turn a couple of pages. Page 860. 2 Peter 1. 16 to 21. By the way, Peter wrote these words, these two letters, to Christians who were suffering terribly. They were brand new Christians, and their, their lives were literally coming apart around them. Persecution from the outside, loss of property, income, jobs. It was awful. And they were tempted to just chuck it all. Peter says, don't do that. Because what you have now by faith in Jesus Christ is the most important thing. He gave them hope in a hopeless world. First, Second Peter 1, 16 to 21. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I'm going to stop there. When was St. Peter an eyewitness of the majesty of Jesus Christ? Mount of Transfiguration with Peter and John. Peter said, I saw the glorified Jesus. Verse 17, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mount. There he mentions it. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter says, I heard the voice of God the Father. And now, what, what does he point to? He said, we can't all wait around. For God to speak to us from heaven as he did to me and James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. So what does he tell us to pay attention to? The Holy, the Holy Spirit who has given us the word of God. God, the Holy Spirit, speaks to us through the word. He calls it prophecy. We would say the word of God. And he says no prophecy ever came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Peter did not wake up one day and say, I think I'll write an inspired letter of scripture. Moses did not wake up and say, I think I'll write Genesis today, and maybe tomorrow I'll try, uh, take a whack at Exodus. No. The Holy Spirit inspired them. Paul talks about that uh, in his letter to Timothy. Here Peter speaks about it. We call it verbal inspiration. And that is such an important teaching. Countless Christian denominations deny that the Bible is verbally inspired and inerrant. And once you do that, Every teaching of scripture suddenly becomes suspect sooner or later. And that's what's happened in Christianity. Liberal Christianity, nothing, the Bible means nothing anymore. Because it isn't necessarily the word of God. How thankful on this Sunday when we're celebrating Luther's Reformation of the Church and the word of God that has been passed down to us. What a great coincidence this is. You have the word of God. Here's how he wants to communicate with you. Back to the question. Why can we be absolutely sure that God's promises are certain? Where do we read his promises? In the Bible. In the Bible. And whose word is it? It's God's word himself. And God cannot lie. He cannot go back on his word. He cannot say one thing and do another. He, cannot, he never says, well, I know I said that and I tried, but I just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't make it happen. That will never happen. He doesn't spin it. He doesn't tweet one thing and do another. He's faithful. Always. Any questions? Let's summarize them. The summary. God created a beautiful world where humans who were created in God's image could live with them. Adam and Eve lost that right by sinning against God. But God did not abandon them. He remained faithful to his original intent. God's faithfulness is our comfort. There you go. He has promised in his word, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can respond with confidence 
The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Boy, in a week when people are going to be filled with a lot of fear. I am not afraid. I have the risen Lord Jesus with me. The word to remember. This passage is the same throughout the Bible study. The purpose of repeating it is to remind the class of God's faithfulness each week and throughout the week. Read it with the class, and as time goes on, have them recite it. By the end of the course, it will stick in their minds and bring them comfort and confidence as they face each day. Psalm 145, the Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. We're going to see that verse every lesson. Uh, during the week, got a couple of things you uh, suggest to read. Anybody have any questions or comments as we wrap this up? I'm looking forward to studying these. Again, there are eight more lessons, and they, they move from here and go all the way into the New Testament. How God remains faithful to his promises to you, to the world full of sinners. Let's close with a prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for sharing your word with us this morning, for the inspiration of scripture by your Holy Spirit. And on this Reformation Sunday, the privilege and the blessing of rejoicing over that truth, praising you for maintaining that truth and handing it on to us. What a privilege. And one of our hymns will sing, in trembling hands, O Lord, we hold that truth. And now it's up to us to transfer that truth on to the next generation in its truth and purity and to share that truth with a world which desperately needs it. Help us hold on to your promise of faithfulness to us in the week ahead. And let us live in that faithfulness and glorify you by the things that we say and do. Amen.